on behalf of the Land Trust Board of Directors and the friends of the Granby Public Library, I just want to say how excited we are to have Pre Professor Talamy with us tonight. And I thank each of you for joining with us as well, as we all seek to do our part in conserving our one and only planet Earth. Since its founding in 1972, the Granby Land Trust has preserved nearly 3,000 acres. We rely on our enthusiastic members for financial support. You can join for as little as $30 at GrambyLandTrust.org. Many members also volunteer their time at work parties on our properties and all are advocates for conservation in Granby and beyond. Doug Talamy's teachings outline a path whereby individual citizens can make a difference. This is exciting and powerful. Our small acts when combined create a blueprint for positive change for the wildlife around us and for our future. And due to the work of folks like Professor Talamy and the input of GLT members in our board, the Land Trust has adapted our property management policies in recent years to further encourage the protection of native wildlife habitat and create more pollinator and bird friendly environments. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention one of my neighbors here in West Granby, Debbie Rillitz. Earlier this year, Debbie delivered copies of Doug Talamy's most recent book, Nature's Best Hope, to more than 30 of her neighbors' homes. She then invited the entire neighborhood to meet via Zoom to discuss how we could all take environmental action in our own yards. At the end of the Zoom, I suggested that we expand the neighborhood by asking Professor Talamy to present to the, to the greater Granby community. With the Granby Land Trust blessing, we did just that, and almost 300 households have registered for tonight's discussion. Thank you for the inspiration, Debbie. Finally, I will turn this over to Holly Johnson with the Granby Public Library, our sponsoring partner. The Land Trust welcomes the opportunity to work with fellow community organizations. We have developed a wonderful partnership with the library. Holly has played a big organizing role and we so appreciate all that she has done to make events like this such a big success. Holly. Thanks, Rick. Um, wonderful, wonderful that Debbie Realitz and your neighborhood were able to, to get Doug here and, and with us this evening. I think this is fantastic. So I just have a few housekeeping um, tips and many of you have heard these before and I apologize if you have to hear them again, um, but here we go. Um, so just a reminder to keep the audio muted. That'll help us immensely as we go through the program. Also to use the chat feature on Zoom on your toolbar, you can send those messages directly to the host or to everyone. So questions and comments can go to everyone. Um, or only a direct message to the hosts. So um, please feel free to use those because we will look at all those questions at the end of the formal presentation and that's when Doug will be able to directly answer those. So we're looking forward to that part too. Um, additionally, I, I always mention this, um, speaker view is a good way to view this program. So I know some people like to have gallery view on their device, but if you use the speaker view, you'd be uh, probably enjoying it more. Also, I wanted to say that, uh, let's see here, we are recording the program. So if you uh, prefer not to have your thumbnail image um, pop up at some point, let's say for example, at the end of the program, if you're asking a question, then you might wanna disable that, but otherwise it's your choice whether or not you want your video thumbnail image to be um, viewed or not viewed. Um, and then I also wanted to make mention that um, there is live transcript um, available on this particular program. So if um, you're enjoying the scrolling at the bottom of your screen, there's nothing that you need to do. But if you'd like to remove that texting, you can go into your toolbar and you can choose hide. I think it's called, let's just look, hide the, hide the text um, or, or something along those lines so that, or hide the uh, transcript so that you won't have to um, uh, have the uh, text message on your screen. If you'd like it, just you can keep it there um, and uh, no problems there. Um, I'm checking my notes because there are so many. Um, again, um, I want to also acknowledge what Rick was saying about the collaboration that the Granby Land Trust and the Granby Public Library um, have got a really good thing going. And so um, I want to acknowledge that and just say thank you again to all the land trust members, all the library friends and members, and then everyone in the surrounding communities that has managed to find this program tonight. So we're really excited that you're here and we invite you to come back and look at the library's website to find more programs like this in the coming weeks and months because um, we've got a good thing going and, and so we're excited about that. 
So let's get down to where we're supposed to be right now with uh, tonight's program. I think I think Rick um, said a few good words about Doug and what what's going on with his um, his best selling books that he's got out there. Um, Bringing Nature Home was one of the first ones um, that we might have heard about. Also, and I'm going to look behind me because we've got Nature's Best Hope here too. So these books are all available at all your local retailers, whether you're an Amazon fan. Barnes and Noble, but of course they're also available at your local library. So please feel free to connect with us and place a, a hold request on the book so you can read it for yourself. Um, we're, we're excited to have the books here. And uh, just another side note, and I don't think I'm jumping the gun on this, um, March 30th, Douglas Tallamy has a new release coming out. So tomorrow will be, um, Let's see what's coming out. The Nature of Oaks will be um, released tomorrow. So there's another great bestseller coming for us. Um, and speaking of Doug, you probably know he's a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware. He has authored 80 research articles and has taught insect taxonomy, behavioral ecology, humans and nature, and other courses for the past 32 years. Chief among his research goals um, is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how such interactions determine the diversity of animal communities. His, um, oh gosh, his book, we just, I just referenced, Bringing Home Nature, How Native Plants Sustain Wildlife, um, was published in 2007 and was awarded the 2008 Silver Medal by the Garden Writers Association. Uh, Doug was also awarded the Garden Club of America Margaret Douglas Medal for Conservation and the Tom Dodd Junior Award of Excellence in 2013. Of course, um, the re book that we are excited about tonight, Nature's Best Hope, is, is another bestseller. And I will encourage you to um, take a look at The Nature of Oaks, which is coming out soon as well. So um, you know what? There's been a lot of chit chat going on here, and I know you all want to hear has to say. So um, I am going to turn the program over officially to Doug. So let's give a warm virtual welcome for Douglas W. Tallamy. Thank you for being here. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. Full disclosure, I've actually been at Delaware 40 years. So that's that's an old CV you've got there. All right. Uh, I do want to tell you what my idea of best, nature's best hope is. But before I do that, I want to return to what happened uh, not this fall, but a year ago fall. We had what uh, is known as an oak mast, where all the members of the red oak group got together and decided to make their acorns at the same time. And this is what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained, so I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. And I was rewarded. An insect started to chew its way out of the acorn. Uh, first, it chewed a, a hole for its head, put its head through there. Then it stuffed the rest of its body through that hole. It was a very tight squeeze. Looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Finally plopped down though. Very dangerous time for this insect larva because uh, it's good to eat. A lot of things are after it. So it gets to safety by wiggling and squirming below the surface of the soil in about 30 seconds. And once it's underground, it stretches on all directions and forms a chamber. And within that chamber, it converts itself to a pupa where it stays for two years. After two years comes out as an acorn weevil. It's what a weevil looks like. A lot of people think they have big noses, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule and the mouth parts are way down here. They take those mouth parts and they chew a hole down into the center of the acorn, turn around and lay an egg in that hole. And that's how the larva gets down into the acorn. You might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the next year like most insects? Uh, and the reason is that it takes red oak acorns 18 months to complete their development. So if they come out the very next year, there won't be enough acorns for them. But once they're out, that does leave a hole in the acorn, a true vacuum. And you know that nature abhors a vacuum. So, excuse me, in this case, she has filled it with uh, three species of temnothorax ants, tiny little ants. Oh, excuse me, my dinner. Tiny little ants that are, uh, they, they, their entire colony lives in the vacated holes made by acorn weevils. And if they find a new acorn, they're excited because their old acorn's falling apart. So they tell everybody it is time to move. Uh, they gather up the larvae, they gather up the pupae, and they work very hard moving the colony into the new acorn. It takes about 30 minutes, but then they're in and they post a guard here to make sure nobody else comes in. And they'll live in this new acorn for the next two years until it falls apart. Well, about this time, my wife says, what's your point? What are you trying to tell us? She says it nicely. Uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that 
that's just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions that comprise most of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and acorns. Jays, it turns out, are the primary dispersers of uh, acorns, of oak, oak seeds. Uh, they grab a, a seed from, from, the acorn, from the oak and then they fly uh, up to a mile away from the parent tree, tap it below the surface of the ground. The idea is that they're going to go get that acorn in the wintertime and have something to eat, but a single jay can bury up to 4,500 acorns in the fall, and they don't remember where all of them are, so they end up actually planting thousands of new oak trees every single fall. Found out this fall what is pollinating witch hazel. I've been wondering about this for years. Uh, witch hazel, of course, is a very unusual plant. It, it blooms after uh, frost, after the leaves have dropped. Uh, so it's, you know, it's practically wintertime, and here it is blooming. And I've never seen anything on those flowers. I always wondered what was pollinating it. But if you go out at night, there's a group of moths called winter moths. This is one of them, the bicolored sallow. Uh, and it turns out these winter moths are the primary pollinators of witch hazel. Uh, so I don't know, these guys really fly, fly late. I caught a bicolored salad on Christmas Eve this year. But I don't know whether they're flying late to take advantage of witch hazel or whether witch hazel is blooming late to take advantage of winter moths. But at this point, they're taking advantage of each other, another specialized relationship. You won't have breeding pileated woodpeckers anywhere near you if you don't have a lot of carpenter ants because that is what they rear their young on. And you won't have carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You won't have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have facilia. That's the only pollen that that bee can rear its young on. And it turns out that pollen specialization is very common uh, in our, our native bees. We have about 4,000 species of native bees in the US and over a third of them can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. So for example, there are at least 13 species of bees in the Connecticut area that can only reproduce on the pollen of perennial sunflowers. You won't have Baltimore checker spots unless you have white turtle head, on and on. I could go on, I could talk all night long about specialized relationships. The problem though, is that today these relationships, nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we didn't take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, stood on the edge, looked out over the magnificent view and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. Problem is that we can't leave the country as it was because we haven't. Uh, there's only about 5% of the lower 48 states. It's anything close to its original pristine ecological condition. And that's because we have, we have logged the country repeatedly. We've tilled it, we've drained it, we've grazed it. We've got 770 million acres of rangeland in the US. That's four and a half times the size of Texas. And of course, we paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them, and you can spell that any way you want. We have polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas. In short, we have carved up those natural areas into tiny remnants of their former selves. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other such remnants to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. You might wonder why we've done this. Uh, I wonder about it, but I suspect we thought that the earth, our nest was so large, the, you know, so gigantic that we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. But of course we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing uh, scary headlines like this at a pretty regular clip. This is one, the insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? We're talking about global insect decline. Somebody's got a mute out there. Um, another one, North America's lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of our North American bird population gone. And now the UN says, uh, well, we're gonna lose a million species to extinction, maybe even in the next 20 years. And I love the way they report this as if it's just one more headline. They might as well say, well, we're gonna lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on to the next headline. Losing oxygen is not an option and either is losing a million species. We have to make sure that doesn't happen. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have, have delivered upon the environment, thus upon all of our houses. But that's what, not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that's going to take small efforts from a lot of people, but those efforts will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return to this headline briefly. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Well, E.O. Wilson told us what it would mean if we lost our insects 
Uh, of course, he's the most famous entomologist of all times, Harvard Emeritus at this point. But he told us this way back in 1987 in a paper he wrote called The Little Things That Run the World. His message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of our flowering plants. And if most of our flowering plants disappeared, that would <clears throat> so drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial ecosystems that the food webs that support our animals, the amphibians, the reptiles, the birds, and the mammals would all disappear. And so would those animals. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that right now rapidly turn over nutrients and all we would have is, is bacteria and fungi. And of course, humans wouldn't survive any of those drastic changes. There is good news, and that is that doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're going to have to change the way we landscape in order to do it. Why is that? Well, remember, humans are products of nature. We are totally dependent on healthy ecosystems because they produce what what we call ecosystem services, the things that actually keep us alive on this planet. Here are some of the things that, that plants deliver. We talk about giving them to us, but they're delivering to all the living things on the planet, like the production of oxygen, pretty important. Clean water, equally important. You know, when it rains, that water is starting a journey to the sea where it becomes too salty to use. Plants slow that journey down and allow us to use that water. They capture carbon pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, use the carbon <clears throat> to build their tissues, and then they pump the extra carbon into the ground through their roots. Now that part's enormously important because uh, our soil scientists tell us that our soils can store seven times the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere right now. We just have to get it out of the atmosphere into the ground, and that's what plant roots do. They build topsoil, they hold it in place, they prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, lots of important things. Uh, what do animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. <coughs> Excuse me. They disperse plant seeds and many other important things. So designing landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services is, is just not a good idea. It never was a good idea, but today it's a, it's a downright terrible idea because we've got 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet. There's more need for ecosystem services today than ever before. We can't afford to waste huge portions of the earth in landscapes like this. There have been visionaries through the ages who have recognized that uh, we humans needed to work on our relationship with planet earth. And Aldo Leopold was one of the most uh, eloquent. He wrote extensively in the first half of the 1900s. One of the things he said was the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Uh, now there have been indigenous groups who've been, been good at doing that uh, for long periods, but by and large, our huge Asian, uh, Western societies and our huge Asian societies have been terrible at doing that. We habitually take more from the planet than it has to offer, uh, completely wrecking an area. Then we go to another area and do the same thing. Uh, and of course, Aldo recognized that that was uh, not a sustainable relationship. <clears throat> so he had a vision. He, he had a dream, really, that we humans were capable of developing uh, what he called a land ethic. In this dream, we would learn to, to use the earth. We have to, you know, we have to farm and lumber and graze and mine and do all those things, but we would learn to do it gently enough so that we could do it without destroying local ecosystems. And that's what he called a land ethic. What he never talked about, by the way, he wrote about that in Sand County Almanac, a great book if you haven't read it. What he didn't write about though, that I know of is developing a land ethic where we actually lived. Uh, and I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect the notion that um, humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time was so deeply embedded in the culture of Adult Leopold's day. It's still embedded in our own culture that he may not have recognized it as an option. What I want to argue this evening is that not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. You know, in the past, conservationists worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. Um, we now need to turn that on its head. We need to save nature, actually reconstruct it where there are a lot of people, because that's almost every place. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive in human dominated landscapes, not hang on by a thread, but actually thrive. Where are we going to do that? We have to do it everywhere, but we certainly can't ignore private property. 
And that's because 85.6% uh, of the US east of the Mississippi is privately owned. About 75% of the entire country is privately owned. If we ignore private property when we're doing conservation, we're going to fail because we won't be working on, on enough land and the areas we will be working on will be too small and too isolated from each other in order for it to succeed. There are a number of, of uh, areas that could become conservation centers though. Um, if, if we thought about that, how about power and pipeline rights of ways? There are 21 million acres in those types of landscapes. Railroad rights of ways, 3 million acres. Roadside, 17 million acres. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Airports, 3 million more acres. You know, the Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are huge areas. Then we have all the places where we live. In rural areas, suburbia, our cities, hundreds of millions of acres in those types of landscapes. So if you add up just those, and you can think of other areas, that's 599 million acres where we could be doing conservation, where right now we're really not. How big is 599 million acres? It's big. It's bigger than Vermont plus New Jersey plus Maine, Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, plus California, even add Texas in there. Not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. We can do conservation almost anywhere. When I talk about conservation, what I'm really talking about is, is <clears throat> not saving uh, pristine nature. There's not much of that left. I'm talking about reconstructing the nature that we have, have already ruined. We've deconstructed it. But in order to do that, we have to start with the building blocks. Not all species contribute to ecosystem function equally. So we have to start with those that other, other species depend on. And there's two groups that we, we can't do without. We talked about those flowering plants. They're vitally important. They're capturing the energy from the sun and turning it into to food, uh, which is then in their leaves. We are not gonna have uh, uh, flowering plants unless you have the pollinators that allow them to reproduce. So that's one group that we need. But now the energy from the sun is locked up in the leaves of these plants. Most vertebrates don't eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants, and that's something typically is insects, but not just any old insects. It turns out that caterpillars are transferring more energy from plants to other animals. In other words, caterpillars are feeding more animals than any other type of plant eater, which means we have to develop landscapes with a lot of caterpillars in them, or most of the energy is going to remain locked up in the plants themselves, and that will be a failed food web and a failed ecosystem. Let me give you an example with Carolina chickadees. Now in, in Connecticut, you've got uh, black cap chickadees, but they're doing the same thing. They of course are, are uh, at our feeders uh, right now, but um, where they're eating seeds. So people think, well, that's all they need. But even in the wintertime, only 50% of their diet is seeds. The other 50% is insects. And when they're rearing young, it becomes 100% insects because their babies can't eat seeds. And if they're in a healthy environment, um, they will feed their, their young almost exclusively on caterpillars. So it's not just any old insects. And it turns out that they are not exceptions. 96% of our terrestrial birds are rearing their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do I know that? Well, a number of lines of evidence uh, suggest that. But this is a uh, study that my uh, one of my recent students did, Ashley Kennedy a citizen science project where she actually put out a call to uh, bird photographers from all over the country and asked them to take pictures of birds and send those pictures to Ashley. She was then going to identify the, she wanted to take pictures during the breeding season when they were, when they were feeding their young. So Ashley would then identify the prey items that were in the beaks of the birds feeding their young and reconstruct the nestling diet of as many birds as she could in North America. And she got thousands of pictures. So she was able to reconstruct the nestling diet of 20 common bird families. And that's what you're looking at here. The green bars are the percentage of those nestling diets in each of these bird families that was caterpillars. And in 16 out of the 20 common bird families, caterpillars dominated the diet. So again, imagine what would happen if we develop landscapes that don't support a lot of caterpillars. Something special about caterpillars, what is it? Well, it turns out there's a number of things special about caterpillars. First of all, they're soft. Think of this guy as, as if he's a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is, is cuticle, it's exoskeleton. It's made of chitin, which is undigestible. And because they're soft, you can stuff it down the throat of your baby without fear of injuring it. If you've ever watched a parent bird rear their young, uh, they're pretty rough. The beak is like a plunger. They just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our, our larger uh, or our smaller birds do chase aphids around. 
but do you want to chase 200 aphids or get, get one caterpillar? They are nutritious. They're very high in, in fat, very high in protein. They have a very low percentage of chitin compared to most other insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little, little sausages. They're like little tanks. So much of a beetle is undigestible. And a lot of beetles have, have sharp edges as well. And finally, it turns out that caterpillars are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, uh, but because I'm a vertebrate and you're a vertebrate and birds are vertebrates and we vertebrates cannot make our own carotenoids. We have to get them from plants. Only plants make carotenoids. And we have to get them from plants because carotenoids are essential components of vertebrate diets. And that's why my, my wife, Cindy, makes sure I have a lot of carrots, actually had some tonight. Um, a lot of, uh, to get my, my beta carotene and, and a lot of tomatoes to get my lycopene and whatever that is to get my lutein. And when I eat all those things, they stimulate my immune system. And I can't think of a better time to have a healthy immune system. Carotenoids are, are also antioxidants. They run around our body, protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about things like this, this male prothonotary warbler who is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutines. And he takes those lutines, makes pigments out of them, puts them in his, his feathers. And the brighter yellow he is, the more access to ladies he has. So where are they getting their carotenoids from? Um, from what they're eating, of course, but carotenoid levels are not uh, equal among uh, bird prey items. These first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more uh, carotenoids than other types of, of uh, bird prey. The third bar here is orthopteroids. So things like uh, crickets and grasshoppers and katydids. Here are the adult caterpillars way down here, the, the moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. That's where the carotenoids are. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the earthworm has, has uh, well, the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. So all of this and, and lots of other data are, are strongly suggesting the caterpillars are not optional parts of bird diets. It's really looking like they are essential parts of bird diets. So let's just agree that birds need caterpillars. The next question is, how many do they need? Is one or two enough or is one or two a day enough? Well, let's go back to chickadees and ask that question because we've got a lot of data on chickadees. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of, of chickadees? One or two is not enough. One or two a day is not enough. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to get one clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest, depending on the number of chicks in the nest. Uh, and after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days, but they're flying all around so nobody can count those. So you're really talking about tens of thousands of caterpillars required to make a bird that is a third of an ounce. And if you want chickadees to breed in your yard, you have to have all those caterpillars in your yard because they forage about 50 meters from the nest. And by the way, we do want chickadees to breed in our yards because in so many places, that's all that's left. Uh, so they forage 50 meters from the nest, which means they're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot to, to get their food. So if you don't have, if you don't landscape in a way that creates all those caterpillars, you're not going to have breeding chickadees. That's called bird decline. Uh, and it's really, it's, you're going to have bird decline because of insect decline. It's really looking like insect decline is one of the major factors triggering the loss of birds. We went to the uh, original data set from Rosenberg et al. That's the groups that said we've lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided the terrestrial birds in North America up into two groups, the ones that require insects at some point in their life history and the ones that do not. So these are things like uh, doves and finches that can reproduce on seeds. They actually gained uh, some numbers in the last 50 years. But the birds that require insects, on average, lost 10 million individuals per species. It doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that as, as uh, insects go, so go our birds. So I'm concluding uh, in the language of, of COVID, let's just say in an abundance of caution, we better start landscaping in a way that supports a lot of caterpillars and a lot of other insects as well. Totally different approach to landscaping than what we've practiced in the past. We have thought that all of our plants are decorations and um, we didn't want anything eating them. So we made sure we had dead landscapes. Uh, well, that's not working very well for us. We're now in the sixth great extinction. So what we want to do is recreate landscapes that do have a lot of caterpillars. How do you add caterpillars to your landscapes? 
you do that by adding the plants that support them. But how do you do that? Um, well, you have to be fussy about it. There is a catch. Not all plants uh, support caterpillars. You have to be fussy about it because caterpillars themselves are fussy. And the monarch butterfly illustrates that perfectly. Um, you can have all of the, the calorie pears and burning bushes and crepe myrtles and, and barberries and boxwoods and all the other plants we import from Asia to decorate our yards in your yard and you won't make a single monarch butterfly caterpillar because the only thing they're going to develop on is milkweeds. That's called host plant specialization and it turns out that most of the insects that are eating plants are host plant specialists. Why is that? Well, plants have made them that way. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And if you don't believe me uh, this summer, go out and eat a plant, see if you like it. You're not gonna like it. Um, and that's why it's green in the summertime. It's not because there's no insects out there that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat most of the plants. But insects do eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Every plant lineage that's out there protects itself with a unique compound or, or uh, cocktail of chemical defenses. And uh, a, you know, a given insect species cannot adapt to all of them. So they pick one or two and get good at getting around uh, those particular defenses. They develop the enzymes that store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, the behavioral adaptations and the life history adaptations that um, minimize their exposure to those compounds. But it takes a long period of evolutionary history with those, those uh, plants for all those adaptations to fall into place. It does not happen overnight. And once they do fall into place, they lock the insect into uh, eating just those plants. That's why the monarch can only eat, eat milkweeds. It's specialized on milkweeds. It didn't spend any time learning how to eat oaks or chrysanthemums or anything else. And that's why when we bring plants in from other, other continents, uh, most of our insects can't eat them which means plant choice matters. If we are trying to rebuild the food webs in our yards that support the life around us, we have to choose the plants that will do that because most of them won't. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how well this works when you do choose the right plants. And I'm gonna start with uh, our house right here in uh, Oxford, Pennsylvania. I am sitting in that window right now. This is what it looked like when we moved in. Uh, we've got 10 acres on a, a very old farm that was broken up. Um, it's farmed for 300 years. And the last thing they did before they sold the farm was to mow it for hay. So there were essentially, you know, very few plants here. Uh, again, that's what it looked like. So my goal was to um, rebuild the biodiversity on our 10 acres. And I did that. Oops, I forgot to tell you about this. Um, when they mow for hay, in our neck of the woods. They're really mowing the rootstocks of multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and autumn olive and all of the invasives that are so common around here. So as soon as they stop mowing, uh, this is what returned. This is what the 10 acres looked like. It was totally choked with, with invasive plants, none of which are supporting the, the uh, in insects that run our food webs. So our first goal was to uh, try to get rid of this stuff. And that's largely what my wife, Cindy, did. That's Cindy there getting ready to, to clear out all these things. You know, if you have a, a bad invasive species problem, I sympathize, but don't give up. You can win um, and, and Cindy has, has proven it. What was I doing while she was working hard? I was, I was um, telling her that she was doing a great job, but I also was putting plants back that would support the caterpillars that run the food webs that support our birds and everything else. And these are just some examples. Uh, for ex I wanted to see if I could, I could attract the Canadian outlet to our property. I'd never even seen a Canadian outlet before, but the only way to get Canadian outlets, that's what their adults look like, just like uh, leaves, you have to put their food plant in. They're specialists on meadow row. And we didn't have any meadow row. 
There's no meadow rue anywhere around it. This entire area was farmed to death for hundreds of years. So the meadow rue was long gone. So I got some meadow rue seeds from someplace and I planted them and they grew very nicely. But this was early on and I actually had very little faith that uh, Canadian Alice would be able to find our meadow rue uh, very quickly, if at all. So I didn't, I didn't go out and check it. But one day, about a month and a half after I planted them, I did walk by and I was very surprised to see that uh, they were covered with Canadian Alice. Uh, so it was a, a, a big and rapid success. Uh, and now we have a good uh, population of Metaru and Canadian Alice. So we've added two species to the property. Same story with the Goldenrod Stowaway. Um, that's a misnomer, by the way. This beautiful moth has nothing to do with Goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's Aristosa. I did know where there were some Bidens in a power line cut about uh, 14 miles away. So I went and got the... Uh, got the seeds of the Bidens, planted them at home. They grew very nicely. Uh, well, it took about a year for the goldenrod stowaway to find my Bidens, and, but it finally did. So now we have a good population of both of those. And now we've added four species to the property. One of the Hackberry Emperor, because not because it's the most beautiful butterfly, but because it's a butterfly that ought to be here. Uh, and I'm sure way back when it used to be, but as its name suggests, it is a specialist on Hackberry and we didn't have any Hackberry. So I planted hackberry. Um, took about four years for the butterflies to find my hackberry, but uh, another big success. Walked by one of my hackberry trees in June of this past year, and there were nine hackberry emperor caterpillar butterflies on a single branch. So now we've added six species to the property. I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own, and along with it came many of the things that eat goldenrod like the brown hooded owlet, the Arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct Sparagonothus, the goldenrod gall moth. This is one that hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth. I don't know why it hasn't found our goldenrod, but uh, that's what the caterpillars look like. But this is, this is part of the fun. This is, this is anticipation. It's like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out and check my goldenrod, hoping to find this caterpillar. And one of these years I will, and that'll be a great day. I planted Virginia creeper. I don't know why people don't like Virginia creeper. It's a, it's a great native plant. It has good fall color. It produces wonderful berries for the birds in the fall that are very high in fat. Uh, it has, it's a great pollinator plant that, that nobody seems to know that. The, the flowers are not attractive. They're little yellow green things, but um, the bees sure love them. And it is one of the major host plants for the large sphinx moths that are the primary part of cardinal diets when they're feeding their young. So things like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the uh, lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, all on Virginia creeper. One of the double two prominent. Um, just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar, it looks like a little dinosaur. Well, it's an elm specialist, so I planted American elm, came right away. Wanted the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful. I like beauty like everybody else. So I planted evening primrose, the moth came and it spends the day with its head stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. And finally, I planted lots of, lots of oaks. Uh, this is the Bedford oak in Bedford, New York. Uh, by the way, that, those are just examples of what I planted. It's not, not the whole, whole bit of diversity, but I want to focus on oaks for a while because they are such important plants. Bedford Oak, Bedford, uh, New York. People argue about whether it's 400 years old or, or, or 500 years old. Must be like the Granby Oak. Um, but, you know, this is one of, the, one of the downsides of oaks. People think that they have to be hundreds of years old before they start to contribute. I hear people say, I'm not going to plant an oak because I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Well, if it has to be 400 years old before you can enjoy it, you're right, you won't. But um, I, can, I can tell you from experience that oaks start to contribute to the ecosystem in your yard immediately when you plant them. And I can say that with confidence because I planted most of my oaks as acorns, which meant they were free, or two foot bare root whips, which means they cost $1.50 each. And right away, they started to bring in the, the moth populations that support the food webs around us, like the solitary oak leaf miner, the juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, the orange headed epicolema, the red washed caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streaked dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panapoda, the laugher 
offer and literally hundreds more species of moths have come to the oaks on my property and they come right away. This is a pin oak. It has just popped its head above the leaves and here's a, a caterpillar, a crocus geometer standing on the floor eating the leaves of that oak. So you don't have to wait hundreds of years for your oaks to start to contribute. They do it immediately. This is what our property will look like in probably about a month when the leaves are out. I'm still sitting in this window right here. I show you this just to uh, convince you we're very traditional. We've got lawn right here, but um, we put a lot of plants back. And I noticed early on that uh, as I added new plant lineages to the property, I got new species of, of moths. Remember, I'm focusing on moths because their caterpillars are driving that, that food web. So four years ago, I made it a goal to take a picture of every species of moth that occurs on our property. I'm still doing it because I keep getting new ones, but I'm up to 1,036 species of moths that I have taken pictures of on my property. So that's more species of moths on our 10 acres than all the species of birds in all of North America. Uh, now we do have 10 acres, but Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So on one 240,000th of the land area of Pennsylvania, uh, we have 40% of all the moss species that occur in the entire state. And because so many of these are, are types of bird food, we have recorded 59 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres. Not flew by, but bred. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, in the fall, we saw this headline, another scary one. The earth has lost uh, two thirds of its wildlife since 1970. But I'm thinking not at our house, I'm sure we have increased biodiversity by more than two thirds uh, and it didn't take nearly that long and we did it simply by putting the plants back. So um, I, I'm mentioning this as, as a source of encouragement. We can turn these very scary headlines around. Uh, we just have to, we have to put the plants back and by we, I mean everybody, we all have to do it. But I know what you're thinking. Uh, you know, Cindy and I have 10 acres and, and this won't work in a smaller suburban lot. Well, um, that's a good question. Let's see if that's true. Let's go to Margie and Dan Terpstra's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres. Uh, so that's 18 times less land than, than Cindy and I have. Um, in Kirkwood, Missouri, the major invasive plant was, was bush honeysuckle, Amur honeysuckle. So after they bought this property, that's the first thing they did was get rid of their, their uh, invasive honeysuckle. They are in a typical suburban neighborhood. So all their neighbors have, have the big lawns. So um, they're essentially an island. But after they got rid of their, their invasives, they planted a lot of native plants. Then they put in a water feature they call a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds that have used their property. They are up to 149 species of birds that have used their property, including 35 warbler species. Now just to put that in perspective, uh, we've only recorded eight warbler species at, at our house. So yes, it works on smaller properties. What about urban yards though? Let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, right on the other side of that wall there is uh, one of the runways of O'Hare Airport. Over here is Kennedy Expressway. And Pam has an even smaller property. She's got one tenth of an acre. That is three times smaller than the average lot size in North America. And she is a true island. There's no connectivity with any natural area at all. She did the same thing. She got rid of her invasive plants, planted 60 species of native plants, put in a water feature for her, her birds. Uh, and then she sat back and started to count the birds that have used her property. And she's up to, well, that's an old figure. It's 118 species of birds that have used her property, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen a woodcock lately, you can go to Pam's house and check it out in Chicago. What about city centers though? 82% um, of us live in, live in cities. Well, in 2014, I was staring at this plant, Asclepias tuberosa, butterfly weed. Um, that reminds me, you know, we've got a serious uh, marketing issue with our, our native plants. We call them weeds and wonder why people don't plant them. So let's not call this butterfly weeds anymore. Let, let's call it Monarch's Delight. So 2014, I'm staring at Monarch's Delight. The first thing I see are two species of leafcutter bees, megachylid bees. I know they're leafcutters because they carry their pollen on their tummy, not on their legs. Uh, leafcutter bees have very strict requirements. Uh, not only do they need pollen and nectar, uh, but they also need soft leaves and leaves of red bud are perfect because they cut the edges of those leaves out and leave these little semicircles. Uh, so they take that leaf material, roll it up into a tube, stuff it full of pollen and nectar and or 
just pollen and then lay an egg on it, then wrap it all up and then they stuff that into a, a crack. Uh, and that's how they reproduce. Well, there was a, a red bud growing right next to Monarch's Delight, and I'm pretty sure that's why there were leafcutter bees there. They had everything they needed. I'm also pretty sure that's why there were uh, bumblebees there. Remember, bumblebees every winter as queens. So when they come out in the spring, the queen has to do all the work herself. She's got to start the entire colony and do all the foraging. Um, and she, that means she needs a lot of efficient forage available. And that's exactly what red bud supplies. Um, otherwise, the colony fails. Then I saw a monarch, actually I saw two monarchs. Now this was 2014. In 2013, I had gone the entire year without seeing a single monarch. That was the low point of the monarch population in the East. Um, only 3.6% of the monarchs left compared to 1976. So I was really encouraged. Maybe they weren't gonna disappear at all. And, and this was June, which is very early for us to be seeing monarchs this far North. Very encouraging. Uh, why were they there? Well, they had Monarch's Delight, but they had another uh, species of milkweed as well. I think it's purple milkweed. So they had, they had uh, you know, nectar, but they also had their host plant. They could reproduce. Everything they needed was there. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line in the middle of Manhattan, middle of New York City. High Line, if you don't know, is, was an uh, abandoned elevated railroad. It had been abandoned for years, and somebody went up and looked around. There were a lot of native plants growing there, so they actually decided to make it a, a tourist destination, and they did. Millions of people go to the High Line every year, so it's always crowded, and this is the amount of nature that's up there. It's a three-foot strip of plants that, that follows that, that uh, abandoned railroad. This is Rick, oh, and there's the, there's the Monarch's Delight, by the way. This Rick Dark uh, was always after me to go see... Um, Go see the High Line because of all the wonderful plants. I'm not much of a city boy, so I, I drag my feet. Uh, and you know, seeing beautiful plants with nothing using them is actually depressing to me. And that's what I thought I would see in, in Manhattan. I mean, after all, how are those things actually gonna find these plants? But I was totally wrong. They did find those plants. Somebody's done a, a, a uh, survey of the bees using the High Line right now. It's up to 30 species. Um, so it's very encouraging to me that, that just to realize that if thoughtful native plantings can bring life back to the middle of Manhattan, we can do this anywhere. There are four things we need to think about, though, if we're going to succeed in a big way. Uh, and one of them is we have to shrink the area that's in, in lawn. We've got over 40 million acres of lawn in the U.S., which is uh, bigger than the area of all of New England. Uh, and of course, lawn is not not a functioning ecosystem. It's a deadscape. It's a, it's a status symbol. Um, so let's, I'm not suggesting we get rid of lawn, but I am suggesting we cut the area in half by putting plants in, in our yards. Shrink that, that area. We're, the area of lawn we keep is still going to be manicured. Um, we'll still be good citizens. It'll be okay. But if we shrink the area of lawn in half, that'll give us 20 million acres uh, that we can use to create a new national park. And if we do it at home, we can call it Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, plus the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. So we will have the largest national park in the country. What do we get when we put a park at home? Well, you get the, the option, the opportunity to develop a personal relationship with the natural world at your own time, at your own pace. Maybe you had one as a child and you've lost it. You can, you can reestablish that or develop it for the first time. And you can do it without facing the huge crowds you see at, at uh, national parks. You go to a national park, there are millions of people there. It's also free. There's no admission charge. Um, you can visit it regularly. It's never closed. Depending, you know, it doesn't matter what, what pandemic comes down the road, it's not closed. No travel hassles, and you get to experience the natural world alone. I think this is key. I don't know how anybody can develop a personal relationship with, with nature unless you are alone. And this is particularly important for our kids. You know, Richard Lewis says our kids are, are suffering from nature deficit disorder because they just have so little experience with the natural world. So we're trying, we get a bus and we put 30 kids and a teacher on the bus and they drive for an hour. Then they walk around a natural place for an hour. Teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back on the bus and they, they go home. 
And I'm sure that's better than nothing. But what that really is an experience with is 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If we have a park at home, the kids can simply go outside and discover it alone, no parental supervision. This is the critical part. Let them work it out by themselves and, and create that personal relationship. And maybe they will learn how to hunt lizards. I am learning this from my own granddaughter, Zoe, who lives in Hawaii on a very modest piece of nature. It's a little patch of lawn with a hedge, but there are anole lizards there. So she sent me this, this uh, photo to describe how you hunt lizards in Hawaii. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with leaves and sticks so the lizards don't see you coming. And then you crawl very slowly towards the lizard. No smiling, this is serious business. You can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you, you crawl towards the lizard, you catch it, you put it in an aquarium and there's your personal relationship. Now, I don't think Zoe's gonna be, be crawling on the ground in her best dress, uh, catching lizards the rest of her life. I don't think, although she did send me this, this picture the other day. So um, maybe I'm wrong, maybe she will be. But I guarantee that her experience catching lizards in, in Hawaii will um, make her a, a better steward of the planet when she grows up. That's the key. Our kids are the stewards of this planet. And if they don't have that personal relationship, I don't know how they're gonna be good stewards. If you want your kids to do more than catch lizards when they, uh, when they go outside, get this book, Nature Play at Home by Nancy Stranisti. Dozens of examples of how to expose your kids to the natural world right where they live. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, go to our, our new website, homegrownnationalpark.org, uh, and get yourself on the map. So let's see, we're up here in Connecticut. What you do is, is you enter your location and the amount of area that you're converting to, um, to native plants, because that's what you need. Uh, and you'll get to see your little area of your county is going to light up. You'll get to see who else is there, or at least other properties that are there. Um, we can have competitions between counties. We want to get that 20 million acres uh, all lit up here on the map. But I'm thinking, uh, why stop at 20 million acres? Let's do the let's do the entire country. All right, we're going to shrink the lawn. What plants are we going to put in the area that we take out of lawn? Well, some of them have to be what I'm calling keystone plants. Remember what the Roman arch uh, looked like? Looked like this. And the stone in the middle was called a keystone. And if you took that stone out, the arch collapsed. Um, well, that's the role of keystone plants. If we take them out of our, our uh, local food webs, the food webs will collapse. Why is that? Because they're making most of the food. Just 5% of our native plants are making 75% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives those food webs, which means 86% of our plants are contributing, but not all that much. So if we're building a, an ecological house in, in our yard, the, the keystone plants are the two by fours of that house. They are essential or the house will fall down. Um, so you, you can't build a house out of, out of wallpaper. But the other plants, of course, will add to the house and help you complete it. So the question is no longer simply, are, are natives better than, than non-natives? On average, they certainly are, but there are a lot of natives that, that don't uh, support all that much. So we certainly wanna focus on the ones that are the most ecologically productive, and we wanna avoid the ones that are destructive. Those, those Asian plants that escape our yard and become serious invasive species, like burning bush, like, like barberry. Uh, like buckthorn, these are all ornamentals we brought in and now they're, they're biologically polluting, ecologically castrating all the natural areas around us. I get an email once in a while from somebody saying, don't you know that ginkgos, ginkgo bilobas from Asia actually grew in North America 7 million years ago. That makes them native. That means we can plant them and everything will be great. Yes, I do know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native tonight but, um, or today, but I'm not going to have that, that argument because that's not the metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not. It's whether they're productive or not. I don't care if ginkgos grew on the moon 7 million years ago. They, they support zero species of caterpillars. And yes, I know there's two rare records on there, uh, but you're never going to find a caterpillar on ginkgo. I never have. Where you are going to find your caterpillars are on... Uh, the most productive keystone plants in 84% of the, of the country, and that is our oaks. 
557 species of caterpillars uh, uh, supported by oaks in the mid-Atlantic states. That's 557 species of bird food and over 900 species nationwide. No other plant genus comes close to that. And here's the role of keystone oaks, uh, the role that they are playing in my yard. Now, so far, I've taken pictures of 1,036 moss species. Haven't gotten to the butterflies yet. I will get to them soon. But out of the 1,036 species, 911 have known host plants. Of those 911, 270 species use oaks. And we have 69 genera of native woody plants on our property, and only one of them is, is Squircus, the oaks. And we have hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity. But they're supporting at least 30% of our moss species diversity. So imagine what would happen if I took that one genus of plants out of our, our system. Our diversity would plummet. That's the role of keystone plants. How do you find out what the keystone plants are in your yard? You go to Native Plant Finder, the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the rank list of woody and herbaceous plants that are best in your county will pop up. So this is what a li uh, list is gonna look like. And you know, this is, I stopped because I ran out of room. This is not the entire list, but um, oaks are gonna be number one in, in anywhere in Connecticut, uh, followed by native cherries and native willows, blueberries are all native, um, native birches, native maples. Notice I'm saying native all the time. That's because if you go to the to the nursery and say, I want to buy a cherry, uh, almost certainly they're going to sell you a flowering cherry from, from Asia. If I want to buy a willow, they'll sell you a weeping willow from Turkey. If I want to buy a birch, they'll sell you a European birch or a maple, be a Japanese maple. You've got to special, specify that you want a native member of these native genera. Because if you get a non-native member, uh, you're going to reduce caterpillar use by 65%. We've done that experiment. These are the top herbaceous uh, plant genera. Uh, in, in, uh, <clears throat> they're going to be the top ones in Connecticut. Goldenrods are going to be way up there. The various uh, genera that asters were split up to will be way up way up there. Sunflowers, particularly perennial sunflowers, way up there. Not only in terms of making caterpillars, there's 110 caterpillars on goldenrod, by the way, uh, but also in terms of supporting the specialist bees, all those bees that can only reproduce in the pollen of particular plants. If you have goldenrods, asters, and, and sunflowers in your yard, you will support over 40 species of, of specialist bees that won't be there if you don't have those plants. Okay, we're going to shrink the lawn. We are going to put in keystone plants. We're going to attract a lot of, of insects to our yard, and then we will kill them with our security light, which of course is not the goal. There's a lot of research coming out now, particularly from Europe, which is uh, very convincingly demonstrating that light pollution, those lights we have on at night, uh, are one of the major causes of insects decline. And these are all the ways that lights kill insects from exhaustion. The moth flies around and around, around till it drops or collisions with the light bulb. They get incinerated. They die from dehydration. The bat comes and picks them off. A lot of our, our uh, nocturnal insects are blinded by bright lights and it keeps them from doing what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, this is actually good news to me, believe it or not. We have to turn around this decline of insect populations. Remember, we're not going to be on this planet without them. We've got to turn that around this around. And it turns out that, that uh, you know, if light pollution is one of the major causes of insect declines, it's the easiest one to turn around. Just turn out your light, flick of a switch. But I know what you're going to say. I can't turn out my garage light because the bad man will come. Okay, put a motion sensor on that bulb so that it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to find is that the bad man doesn't come very often. And if you don't want to do that, take the white bulb out of your, your security light and put in a yellow bulb. The white uh, mercury vapor bulbs are the very worst. They're so attractive to insects. But if you put in a bulb with yellow wavelengths and a yellow LED bulb is the least attractive, um, you're going to save billions of insects. If we, if we switched out all of our, our night lights for yellow LED bulbs, we would save billions of insects during the summertime and billions of dollars too, because it's a, they're really energy efficient. 
Okay, we're gonna we're gonna shrink the lawn. We're gonna put in keystone plants. We're gonna turn out our lights, and then we'll invite Mosquito Joe to come kill all our insects. We just have no end to the ways we like to kill insects. This is a booming business uh, around the country right now. And uh, Mosquito Joe will say, "Well, it's okay because this is a natural product, uh, and it is a natural product. It's it's pyrethroids um, made from from chrysanthemum, but cyanide is a natural product too. So that doesn't make it okay." He'll also say it only kills mosquitoes which is not, not even close to true. It kills all the insects that it comes in contact with. The big thing here is that it doesn't work. You don't kill, you don't try to control mosquito populations in the adult stage. You control them in the larval stage. In order to control a mosquito in the adult stage, you have to kill 90% of the mosquitoes. Mosquito Joe kills about 10% of the mosquitoes. So he's not even close to working. And that's why he has to keep coming back and back. Uh, and he's very, very expensive. The way to control mosquitoes is in the larval stage. Uh, get a bucket, fill it full of water, put in some straw or hay, let it ferment for a couple of days. What you're doing is building up algae and, and diatoms in your bucket, and that becomes irresistible to uh, female mosquitoes that want to lay their eggs, ovipositing mosquitoes. They lay their eggs in your bucket. Then you go to the hardware store and you get uh, mosquito dunks. This is a mosquito dunk. It's uh, Bacillus thuringiensis. It's a natural uh, bacterium that attacks aquatic diptera. And the only aquatic dipterin in your bucket here is uh, our mosquitoes. So you put that in there and the mosquito larvae nibble on it and they die. If a dragonfly gets in here, it doesn't hurt it. If your dog licks it or if a bird uh, drinks out of it, it doesn't hurt it a bit. So it's effective, it's cheap, uh, and it's extremely targeted, only kills mosquitoes. The fourth thing we need to do is to allow caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where there are 511 species of caterpillars that develop on oaks. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. The caterpillar eats the leaves of the tree, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from uh, the branches, uh, and then it emerges as an adult and does it all over again. So everything happens on the tree and I wish everything did that, but most of the species that are using oaks do not complete the development on the tree. 94% of them drop from the tree after they finish growing and wiggle their way beneath the, the soil if the soil is loose enough and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under the tree. And that's the problem. There is no leaf litter under the tree and the ground is mowed and compacted so much that the caterpillar can't get under there, which makes the way we landscape an ecological trap. We call in those moths to lay their eggs, the caterpillars develop, then they drop down and die. I am convinced that uh, the way we landscape today is uh, one of the, even if we use the right plants, the way we treat the area under those plants is another major cause of insect declines. And of course the cement landscape is even less of a viable option. Uh, I'm not trying to discourage the use of, of trees in cities. I'm trying to discourage the, the profligate use of cement as a default landscape. Um, that's just laziness. We know it destroys watersheds. And cement, by the way, is a major releaser of, of carbon dioxide, greenhouse gas. Now, what most people do, of course, is have a big tree in the middle of a, a yard, in the middle of lawn. Nobody's measured how well caterpillars survive in a situation like this. Uh, but I guarantee they survive much better in a situation like this, where you have a layered landscape. So you've got your tree, maybe a dogwood over here, and then, then uh, a native azalea, then ferns and ground cover. Caterpillar drops down to a safe site. The soil's not compacted. They can easily get below the ground. Nobody's going to step on them. Nobody's going to mow them. Or they can spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that's under there. Survivorship will be much higher. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. This is how you shrink the lawn. You put beds around your trees to create those safe sites. This is where you can use your, your ground covers, things like uh, wild ginger or may apple or foam flower or uh, many other species, including ferns. Uh, this is a, a hotel in Athens, Georgia. These are red maples. So any caterpillar that develops on these trees can drop down, even though it's the middle of a city, they can drop down into this safe site and complete their development. We can do this in, in uh, almost every place that we have out there. Another grad student, Desiree Narango, has done some uh, wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, DC. And her results suggest there's actually room for compromise in our plant choices. Uh, and that's good news. What she did was look at how well landscapes that are dominated by native plants. These are suburban yards inside the beltway of DC. 
how well na landscapes dominated by native plants can sustain chickadee populations compared to landscapes dominated by introduced ornamental plants. And the first thing she found is when those landscapes are, are uh, dominated by introduced plants, they're producing 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, the amount of bird food is reduced by 75%. They were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. So there's nest boxes up in each one of those landscapes, but um, the chickadees would come and look around and say, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try. If they did try to nest, those nests contain 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to survive at all. If they did survive, the nest produced 1.2 fewer fledglings and it took them 1.5 days longer to, to leave the nest. And if you put all that information together in uh, a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass in your yard from none to 100%, this is what you get. This dotted line is replacement rate. That's the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. Uh, if you breed at that, at that rate, um, you have a sustainable population. It's not growing, but it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. But if you make fewer babies, you've got a shrinking population, an unsustainable population. I like this study for two reasons. It's the first time that this has been measured for any bird anywhere. So if you're wondering whether your plant choices actually do impact the birds around you, this is a good place to start. Uh, but here's that area of compromise I'm talking about. Right here is where those lines overlap, which suggests you can have up to 30% of your woody plant biomass non-native in your yard without destroying the local food web if 70% of your, your woody plant biomass is native. Um, now, none of these should be invasive because that's, that's just irresponsible. Uh, but you can have your ginkgo, you can have your crepe myrtle, you can have your boxwood, things that don't move on their own as long as they don't dominate your landscape. And to me, that's good news because if my message was you can't have any non-native plants, very few people would be listening. Remember, it's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys local food webs. It's the absence of the native plants that support those food webs. So if we increase the percentage of these native plants, we can tolerate some non-natives. Can we use natives in formal designs? Of course we can. This is a, a, a garden in North Carolina. Somebody sent me this picture. And what they're doing is replacing the, the standard non-native plants with natives. This is, this is Joe Pye. Notice I didn't call it Joe Pye weed. It's not a weed. And they're going to replace all of these and then send me a picture. Remember, formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. And I guess that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator garden into a suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can. Just put a little fence around it. Now, it's not very big but it formalizes this collection of, of, of blooming plants. Um, so it's not just a pile of weeds. You're meeting the needs of a number of species of, of native bees. Um, let's remember why we need pollinators. You hear all the time, you need pollinators because they pollinate a third of our crops. But a lot of people think, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. It's much more than pollinating our crops. First of all, it's, it's only about a 12th of our crops that are really pollinated by, uh, by our pollinators. We need pollinators because they pollinate 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants. So forget, forget the crops. If we lost our pollinators, we'd lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Not an option. Where do we need those pollinators? Everywhere you need plants, which is everywhere. How about this? This is a Drew Latham design. It's much bigger. Imagine the amount of life that is here versus the amount of life that is here. Seems like a no brainer to me. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can, and more and more of them are doing it. Minnesota uh, has uh, one of the oldest cost-sharing programs that encourages homeowners to uh, replace some or all of their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. They help you pay for it. Pennsylvania, I just learned about this a couple of weeks ago, is a lawn conversion program. You can get up to $5,000 per acre to pay for converting lawn uh, into, into good habitat. Now this was designed not to save biodiversity, but to improve watersheds. But I don't care what the motivation was, it will save biodiversity at the same time. Uh, I think Maryland and Virginia have similar programs as well. There's an island of Florida 
uh, where they are paying, paying people to allow burrowing owls, listed species, to burrow in the front yard. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written, with carrots rather than sticks. Where if you have an endangered species on your property, they, get, they pay you to take care of it, as opposed to fining you if you use your property. Everybody would want an endangered species. Missouri, Fayetteville, Arkansas have a, a uh, bounty on calorie pears. You take out a calorie pear, one of the most invasive ornamentals we can use, and they give you a free tree replacement. Even public utilities are getting into the act, giving people $100 coupons to put in water. This is in San Antonio, put in water efficient native species and take out those water thirsty uh, non-natives. And of course, there's the big lawn conversion programs in California, particularly. $2 per square foot rebate for every square foot of lawn you, you uh, replace with a Xeric planning. It's very popular, a lot of people doing it. I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. The first one is that we have not, we've not treated nature as if it's essential. We like it. Some people even think it's important, but it's not essential, which means once, you know, whenever resources are in short supply, which is all the time, nature will take a back seat. I went to the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out. Uh, and there was this wall sized poster there that says we need to save wildlife for future generations. And the implication is the future generations are going to employ it or, or enjoy it. Um, this was Teddy Roosevelt's argument for creating the national park system. We need to save it so that, you know, all the future generations can enjoy all these these wonders. And I agree with that, of course, but that does suggest that nature's there just for entertainment. No wonder we don't think it's essential. Entertainment's not essential. But nature's much more than that. We need to save nature so that we have future generations. It's a little bit more urgent. Second misstep is that we've, we've assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. Now we talked about this, but if we, again, if we only do conservation where there aren't a lot of humans, we're gonna fail because those areas would be too small and too isolated from each other. David Quammen has an excellent relation, uh, uh, um, analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And this is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. And I hate that language because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including our corporate landscapes, even including uh, many of our agricultural areas. So we need to glue our rug back together again by putting the plants back and focusing on those keystone plants. We're not just talking about building biological carters so that the plants and animals can move back and forth between viable habitats. I'm talking about building viable habitats where we live, where we work, where we play, and to a lesser extent, where we farm. In other words, we're going to start to share our human spaces with the natural world. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship to just a few specialists, a few biologists, a few ecologists, conservation biologists. We didn't see it as an inherent responsibility of every human being on the planet. But I don't know why, because every human being on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't everybody have the responsibility for good Earth stewardship? Stan Rushworth, a Cherokee elder, once said that the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of indigenous people is, I have obligations. We've been, you know, you're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. We've been good at teaching this one. We've been terrible at teaching our kids and our, our peers about their obligations to earth stewardship. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you really can save it where you live. And this approach uh, empowers each one of us, which is important because right now so many of us feel absolutely powerless. The earth's problems are huge, and it really does seem like one person can't make a difference at all. But in this case, the, the cliche is correct. One person can make a difference and you can see that difference happening right in your yard. Go outside, plant a keystone plant, reduce your lawn, put in a pollinator garden and get rid of your invasive plants. And you will, you will watch your, your little local ecosystem blossom right in front of your eyes. 
Uh, so that makes you an important cog in the future wheel of conservation. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. Just worry about your little piece of the planet. If you own property, that's obvious. That's where you're going to focus. If you don't own property, volunteer and help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy. Help a park. Help a preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you. So as property owners or as volunteers, each one of us has the power and we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether or not we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own. And I think I've convinced my grandkids that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much. Wow. Doug, that I, I'm still speechless. <laughs> that was absolutely fantastic. Um, so much information, so many great comments in the in the chat. And um, wow. Okay, so let me recover for a minute <laughs> because really, there's been a lot going on. We've had a lot of um, general comments, direct messaging. I'm getting text messages, so. Um, I, I promised folks that we would start at the top with responding to the chat questions that came in. And so um, there were a couple early on that referenced, um, and we're asking just in general, if, if you had some feedback on how to get rid of woody invasive plants. So this is, this is more of the folks that are trying to deal with those invasives. And I'm not sure if you mentioned this earlier, but did you have some from tips for that or can you direct people in another? Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I saw your wife, right, your wife yeah. was working really hard, but I don't know if she, she'll come to Connecticut. So. <laughs> she's she's got to stay here, got to keep working. <laughs> um, all right, you, you know, you, to get rid of invasives, you have to kill the root system. And there's two ways to do that. There's an easy way and a hard way. The easy way, of course, involves herbicides. And my wife is one of those people who just won't use them. Um, so she likes the hard way, which is you keep cutting them back repeatedly until you exhaust the root system. Or if they're small enough, you can just pull them out. Uh, that's great. But um, you know, for things like autumn olive or burning bush or those big woodies you're talking about, it's what I do is I cut them off at the base and I, I paint it with an herbicide. It's very little material. I don't spray because you always hit things that you don't want to hit. But if you paint, you use very little material. It's a compromise. I view um, herbicides in the same way that, that I view um, chemotherapy. You know, you get cancer, you need chemotherapy. And you could say, well, I don't want it. Okay, but there, there are consequences to that. If we, if we say, well, I don't want to use herbicides. I'm just going to let the, the invasives go. There are serious consequences to that too. We're really, really um, destroying our ecosystems to let these things keep spreading. So it's a necessary evil uh, for a while, but once you get rid of them, you got, got rid of them. So that's what I recommend. You got to kill the, the root system one way or the other, but painting and cutting, particularly for those woodies is the way to go. Otherwise they just keep coming back. Absolutely, thank you. That's good information. Um, we also had some questions um, for the general audience and for you too, uh, Doug, uh, regarding purchase of Monarch Delight. Um, and I know someone responded that Native Plant Trust might maybe could help them out. So what do you have to say about that? Yeah, you know, I don't know the, the, the sources in New England, um, but it's a it's it's one of the milkweeds, of course, and it's a very popular one. So any place that sells plugs uh, probably will sell uh, um, it's, you know, it's Asclepius tuberosa. Nobody calls it Monarch Delight but me. So don't ask for that. <laughs> They should, but North, <laughs> North Creek Nurseries uh, in, in Pennsylvania certainly sells them, but there's a number of people that do. Okay. Um, now we did have a question and I think you might've answered it um, already, but someone was asking um, regarding native plant finder. Um, it's, they said, how do you find out what is native to my area? And I think probably within two or three minutes you came up, I, I thought I heard you say something about native plant finder. Right. Uh, so you go to National Wildlife Federation website and Native Plant Fighter is part of that website. Uh, put in your zip code and then the top ranked native plant genera for your county will pop up. So all the numbers and it will tell you the number of species of, of caterpillars that that particular plant genus supports in your county. So uh, some of those genera do have non-native members, but all the records are for the natives in, in your 
your county. Excellent. Okay, that's good information. Um, I just wanted to share that one of our other um, attendees tonight mentioned that the Granby Tax Assessor has a GIS tool. That's um, GIS is Geographic Information System Mapping. Apparently, there's a GIS tool. I was not aware of this, but it um, takes your estimated acreage and it helps you plan for um, native plant conversion. So, really? Yay! I didn't know about it, so I'm going to have to look look at it a little more and see that for myself but yeah so that yeah it, i'd love to get some information on that because you know when people want to get on the map for homegrown national park that's their biggest thing how do i measure the area i'm doing is mm -hmm. we say well you just have to guess but so oh. this would be a good tool i'd like to know about this yeah, yeah I, I i we're gonna have to take a look well for those of you that are watching and that are granby residents or maybe even not granby residents um well i guess you have to own property you could go to the um uh, the website, which is granby-ct.gov, and then I'm sure you can find the tax assessors um, tab in there and, and explore that a little more further. Um, also, let's see, we had um, some specific questions about milkweed, tussock moths. Um, I guess these things are getting on her milkweed and just totally annihilating them. And then I think she followed up with another question about spotter, spotted lantern fly. So Okay, two very different insects there. The, the milkweed tussock moth is a native insect. It's, it's part of the, the, the fauna that uses milkweed. And they feed gregariously. So when, when a moth lays its eggs on a milkweed ramet, they do eat the whole thing. It doesn't kill your milkweed, by the way. Your milkweed will come up from the roots, but yes, it looks like it's devastated it. But that's, you know, that's just one of those, that's why you have milkweed is to, is to create the insect life that drives our, our ecosystems. The key is to have enough milkweed so that a single moth like that doesn't, doesn't wipe you out. A lot of people say, I plan, I'm gonna plant a milkweed for a monarch and they plant one ramet of, which is not even enough for a single monarch caterpillar. So that will eventually spread, but, but you wanna make, make a milkweed patch, not a milkweed plant, so that it's big enough that it can support the things that normally eat milkweed. Um, the spotted lanternfly is a non-native plant or uh, insect that we certainly don't want to encourage. We don't wanna encourage any of our non-native invasive insects because they are totally destructive. They're here without their natural enemies, and that's the problem. The spotted lanternfly is a new one. Um, it, it feeds on fruit-bearing plants, and, and particularly the fruits, that, which are not defended at all. So it has a very wide uh, host, host range, although when it's developing, it likes Alanthus the best. So if you have Alanthus in your yard, you're really looking for trouble with that spotted lanternfly. Alanthus, of course, is an invasive species. It's a good reason to finally get rid of it uh, because they're here in numbers, and, um, and it's a huge problem. Right now, by the way, if you know what a spot and lanternfly egg case looks like, they, it's a very flat, white, smeary thing that's on your branches. Scrape it off. This is the time to do it before they hatch, because once they hatch, they're hopping all over the place. They're hard to control. Okay. Thank you. Thank you much. Um, I also wanted to give a shout out to all the wonderful people that are um, dropping the uh, websites in the chat, the resources that are um, there. Um, I, I think... Um, if I get my act together, I'll be able to put those together and perhaps um, send them out to you all in a, um, a follow-up email if, if folks are interested in that. Um, there's some good good information in here, and I just wanted to acknowledge that there's a lot of folks here that are contributing to the conversation. Um, and uh, let's see here. Oh, we asked again, Deborah wants to know, could you just repeat the name again of Monarch Delight, the, the real name, the true name for Monarch Delight? Butterfly Weed. It's the common name and Asclepius tuberosa is the scientific name. Okay. Um, uh, also, um, let's see here. We've got all kinds of places you can purchase all kinds of uh, native plants. So people are letting us know. Um, uh, I wanna, um, yes, uh, let people know again that we are recording um, this program and we should have it up on the library's YouTube channel. Um, later this week. So hopefully folks will, you know, if you want to go back and revisit and check things out again, you're, you're certainly able to do that. Um, so some more, um, more questions. Um, gypsy moths. What about gypsy moths? Um, and uh, well, let's go with that. There we are. 
Well, they're one of our worst invasive uh, insects. We brought them in more than 100 years ago. They've devastated our oak forest a couple of times, uh, and most recently, just in recent years. What triggers a gypsy moth outbreak is several things, but <clears throat> typically when you have two or three dry years in a row, uh, that suppresses the natural thing that's controlling gypsy moth, which is a fungus, but the fungus needs humidity and a lot of rain. Uh, so if it's dry for a number of years, you get good survivorship of the gypsy moth and then the population builds. So, uh, you know, parts of, uh, the, you know, Cape Cod and then moving through Massachusetts and, and I think down in Connecticut as well. It's been very, very hard these last couple of years. Uh, this is the tough trade-off. We don't want to lose our oaks. You've got a 200-year-old oak. You don't want gypsy moth to kill it. Uh, but of course, if you do spray, if you spray Bacillus thuringiensis on your, your uh, gypsy moth, that year you will kill the gypsy moth and you'll kill all the other caterpillars on that tree too. So, um, you got to save the oak, but we do want you. You want to be sure that you're going to have an outbreak before you do spray, because then you're wiping out everything which the birds need when they come come through. Um, so we do want that fungus to break to outbreak, and it, all you really need is a wet, cool year in the spring. We're headed that way right now. I hope it continues because that should take care of the gypsy moths in New England uh, for this cycle. And sometimes it's 20 years, 30 years before you get another cycle, but um, but terrible problem. And the, the solution is to not bring these guys in to begin with because they don't have the natural enemies to control them. So that answers, I think, an another question. Thank you, Doug. That, that answers, I think, another person's question about whether or not they were a, a necessary food source um, for for birds. And if I, you know, <laughs> what happens when we get rid of them? But it sounds like not well, so much. you know, what, what were the birds doing before we brought it over here? Uh, they were doing just fine. So there are uh, a couple of birds that specialize on hairy caterpillars. The yellow bill and black bill cuckoo is one of them, and they actually will follow gypsy moth populations. But we've got tent caterpillar. We've got fall webworm, plenty to feed the, the cuckoos. We don't want to keep the gypsy moth around just for our birds. Because okay. most birds, they're hairy. They don't like them. Okay, thank you. Um, Mary has a question. Um, so put on your thinking cap for this one. Um, she wants to know, are riparian corridors uniquely significant as migratory corridors and host location for aquatic insects as well as mature forests along steep slopes where trees can become snags and or fall and decay without being cut, removed, stump ground? So uh, I'm, do you, can you <laughs> let, yeah, me, let me you. just agree with her. Yeah, she, has just, she has just named a number of reasons riparian corridors are really important. Um, you know, if you look at a map of all of the, the rivers and secondary streams in the U.S., uh, it covers most of the country. There are a few little holes where we don't have any. But if all of those were well planted with riparian corridor, a riparian corridor, by the way, of plants along a, a waterway, a stream, that would fill in the connectivity we need uh, for the entire country, for plants and animals to move back and forth. It would cover so much land that we'd be done. I mean, the homegrown national park would be, we'd be filled up if we all had good plantings along our, what could be repairing, repairing carters. And they do all those wonderful things you just talked about, including filtering out nutrients before they get into our, our aquatic systems. Um, so we certainly want to encourage that. How wide should a riparian carter be? As wide as you can make it. You know, one foot is better than no feet, but a hundred feet is much better than than one feet. Uh, are they good migratory carters? They are when they go in the right directions. If they're going east and west, you know, most of our birds are flying north and south, um, depending on whether it's spring or fall. Uh, so the Mississippi carter, for example, is a wonderful bird migratory route, and they're definitely following the river. Um, so, okay. Um, looks like we have another one or two questions. Okay, so do you have suggestions for snake worm removal, and are they a source of food for birds? Uh, no, and apparently not. <laughs> uh, I, as far as I know, nobody knows how to get rid of these worms. These are an invasive. Uh, I think she's talking about the jumping jumping worms from Asia. Um, there's three or four species and they call them different things, but they're invasive worms from, from Asia that are not playing nice the way the 
the Euro European worms that have been here for centuries have played. They eat all the leaf litter. They eat all the seeds that are in the soil. They change the soil chemistry. Um, so they're an ecological disaster. And as far as I know, nobody has a clue how to control them. Uh, I wish the birds would eat them, but they just don't seem to be. So uh, you know, maybe a few, I don't know, but not nearly enough to get control. And maybe it's because, you know, they don't have any of those carotenoids, so. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I think I have, what did, where did I just lose it? Here we go. Um, we had a general question about native ground covers, maybe some that weren't too aggressive. And then also a question about um, Kwanzaa cherry trees. Um, if they're a good uh, food source value. So Kwanzaa cherry trees and then native ground covers that aren't too okay. aggressive. Kwanzaa cherries, no, they're not good. They're, they're pretty, but first of all, they're double sterile flowers. So they're not making any pollen or nectar for the, the mm -hmm. pollinators. Uh, and it's, an, it's a non-native cherry. So that's one of those where the, the uh, it's in the genus Prunus, but the, the number of caterpillars using it is reduced by 65% on average because it's from, it's from Asia. So it's, um, it's the decoration. That's what it's there for. Okay. Uh, native ground covers, um, you, you know, usually it's the opposite problem of how do you get them to grow fast enough instead of being too aggressive. Uh, we have native pachysandra and I've had a patch of native pachysandra sitting there and as far as I can tell it hasn't increased at all in the last six or seven years so I wish it would grow faster. You know it's a real good ground cover that nobody uses as is that um, Parthenocystis Virginia creeper. Uh, it's a it's a great ground cover but also think of ground covers in terms of, of a mixed planning. Um, they don't have to all be one species. So, uh, and particularly your, your spring ephemerals can transition through a number of species before they, they uh, disappear. And that includes bloodroot and, and uh, um, you know, foam flower and, uh, oh, just a whole slew of them that I can't think of right now. Uh, but I'm not sure, you, you don't, well, make sure you stay away from the invasives like lesser celandine, which are terribly invasive and spread all over the place. Um, so I hope you're not thinking of that. All righty, I um, thank you, I thank you. And we've had some other folks that, um, oh, let's see. Uh, did you put a deer fence? This is a personal question. Did you put a deer fence on your property? No, 10 acres is, you gotta be rich to do that. <laughs> That's a lot of fence. Would it would have made it much easier because the deer are a terrible problem. So what I did was again compromise. Um, the deer like our native plants just as much as the insects do. So and they don't like the non, the non-native. So the the invasive plant problem we have is largely it's not just that those invasives are so competitive, it's that the deer eat the natives and don't eat them. So it shifts the competitive balance. So what I did was, um, and what do we still do? If I've got a uh, particularly a woody plant, like a young oak or something, and I want it to grow, I put a wire cage around it. If you go to Lowe's or Home Depot, you get five foot uh, galvanized wire in rolls and then cut it to a healthy size. Don't make it thin like this so the branches are all scrunched up. Make it nice and wide and then the branches can spread out. Uh, and those things last forever. I, you know, I started them the first year we moved in. It's been 20 years now, and I just call it graduation. The plant gets big enough, and I move it to another one and move them all around. And then the deer can't can't clobber them. Okay, uh, but you. you know, it's. I wish we didn't have to do that. Well, let's see. I, I noticed that the clock is is moving along here, so I don't want to keep Doug for the entire evening. But I do have, I guess, two more. It looks like questions that came in. Um, one was about bittersweet. Were there two? Di are there two different kinds? And then the other one is just blueberry bushes. And I, I think hey. you might have touched on those earlier, but maybe we, you can tell us more. Blueberries, uh, you know, the, the genus Vaccinium is pretty large. There's a number of different species. They're all good. Uh, they're great uh, plant. They make the, uh, you know, the berries in the summertime, which, which you and the birds love. Uh, but it's a good host plant for caterpillars as well. And they have good, good fall colors. Lots of good things to say about uh, blueberries. And they're a, they're a shrub, good understory uh, planting. There are two, two bittersweets. There's the American bittersweet and the Oriental bittersweet. Uh, but you know what? Soon there's only going to be one bittersweet because they hybridize. 
and the Oriental bittersweet through introgression in exactly the same way that the Africanized bee can take over uh, European honeybees. Um, the next generation after they hybridize turns out to be almost entirely Oriental bittersweet. And then the American bittersweet disappears. So down, down where I live, there is no Amer American bittersweet. Uh, it's all Oriental bittersweet. And the last time I saw American bittersweet was Maine. So I don't know if you still have any in Connecticut. Everybody thinks they do. And then when you check it out, it never, never really is. Um, and even nurseries will sell American bittersweet and it's not, it's Oriental bittersweet. So um, that's, you know, the old, they were saying, well, there's no invasive plant that's caused the extinction of, of a native plant on, on a continent. They have on islands, but not on a continent. Very soon, that's not going to be true anywhere because of this intergression. And that goes for mulberry too. White mulberry crosses with red mulberry. And a noted botanist told me recently that you have to go to Texas now to find red mulberry. All of it is white mulberry um, all up and down the east. So, so we're losing at least two species of native plants that way. Well, thank you. Thank you for all this wonderful information. Um, it, it's actually very inspiring, Sue. I, um, I did get a chance to read through parts of your book and I think it's really useful and easy, easy to read for those of you who haven't had a chance to refer to any of Doug's resources. The book is well-written, easy to find answers to your questions. I love the frequently asked questions section at the back. Um, I'm looking forward to um, the, um, the oaks, the nature of oaks coming out soon. That's gonna be another wonderful um, resource for us. I wanted to let everyone know that um, during the program, I also heard from a few of the attendees who want to gather together after this program and do more, re, uh, more sharing of information and, and sort of um, work together and develop something along uh, those lines where, and I, I know there's folks out there that are already kind of doing this with different groups in town. So we're gonna use the Granby Land Trust uh, website as a clearinghouse. So anybody who's interested in pursuing more of this and working together with a group um, in, in town, um, you're welcome to um, contact um, info at grambylandtrust.org. That's um, a good way to leave a message and they will serve as a clearinghouse um, for those questions and those people that wanna learn more. Also, I will um, work to get this um, resource list out to some folks and um, uh, let's see, what else can I tell you? I just wanna say on behalf of the Granby Land Trust and the Granby Public Library, we thank you all for showing so much interest in this um, wonderful topic and um, coming to hear Doug Tallamy talk about this. Doug, you were a fantastic speaker. I, the information was phenomenal um, and you kept me on the edge of my seat the whole night and everybody else too, based on the questions and the comments that were flowing around. So that was excellent. Um, thank you. I, I wish you, you're welcome, and I, I wish you the best, and I wish your wife your the wife. best. You, you need to buy her um, a uh, uh, new pair of gloves, gardening gloves. Yeah, I got you? her. I got her cutters sharpened today. Yeah, that was perfect. a great present. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. I'm I'm glad glad to hear it. And uh, again, I a lot of the comments here are just singing your praises. People thought you were amazing. They're thanking you. Um, and and we were just so glad to be able to to have you with this Zoom presentation tonight. I appreciate the invitation. All righty. Well, everyone, I would like to uh, thank you again for attending. And please don't be strangers. Come back and see us again sometime. You can uh, find more programs on the library's website. And we do a lot of collaborating with a lot of other organizations. So um, you know what? It's 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 all good. It's all really good. And Rick, thank you very much for. For putting this together and um, right. we're glad we have you. All so right. good night everybody. Take care.